Hello and welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. Today we are in the last lecture in our first module. The first module as you are aware is introductory in nature. We have already been through several lectures dwelling on different aspects of English studies and today we are in the last and the eighth lecture of this module and this lecture is entitled the rise of cultural studies. However, as always let us uh, you know look at what we did in the last lecture. We do a recap of lecture 7 in module 1. Okay. Uh, the seventh lecture in the first module was devoted to world Englishes and we found among other things that the scope of studying world Englishes is manifold. Okay. Among the most important areas are as we see uh, on this slide are looking uh, these areas are looking at world Englishes from the point of view of uh, history of you know the rise of English and the spread of English onto different parts of the world. Okay. The different diasporas that have been formed, um, people moving onto other countries particularly to uh, say the western world and how they have uh, you know created or rather how they have um, you know um, how the English language is manifested through them. Uh, we also looked if you look at this slide here, we also looked at, at looked at the variations of the English language in different parts of the globe given the fact that the language has traveled to many corners of the world. Uh, we also looked at processes of acculturation, okay, how populations have accultured themselves okay, to the English language and also how the English language has been of course modified okay, as it found itself in different parts of the world. We also looked very importantly at the issue of uh, creativity which is another aspect of the scope of uh, uh, you know um, studying English as world Englishes and finally we also found that ideology or world views are very important as far as studying world Englishes is concerned. Then we also found that if we went uh, uh, you know deeper into it there are other issues which form part of the scope of world Englishes and these are issues like the sociolinguistic context. Pedagogy or what is pedagogy? Pedagogy is the science and art of teaching. Uh, it also includes not just methods of teaching, it also includes how ped true pedagogy different ideologies okay, or world views are propagated. Then we also found that applied language studies, globalization, language policies and critical linguistics these are also part and parcel of world Englishes as a domain of study. Well, what did we find next? We looked at an important scholar in the field of world Englishes, a scholar of Indian origin named Braj Kachru and we looked at some of the points raised by him in his essay, World Englishes Approaches, Issues and Resources, where he talked about the spread and stratification of English, the characteristics of such stratification, the interactional context of the English language, the implication of the spread of Englishes and the descriptive and the prescriptive concerns that rise okay, with the coming in of such a phenomenon or a cluster of phenomena known as world Englishes. We also found through him that the other areas that may be studied or other components of world Englishes are issues like bilingual creativity, the existence of multi canons, nativization uh, of the Eng English language and literature and Englishization of native languages and literature, the fallacies that crop up because of this phenomenon called world Englishes, the power and politics of English and 
the problems and aspects and prospects of teaching world Englishes. So, you see we found in the last lecture that it is indeed a very rich domain okay, with its scope really embracing so many issues, so many um, you know uh, so many subdomains including those of ideology, of politics, okay, of creativity, of bilingualism, of canons etcetera. Right? We also saw that there is indeed an association for the study of world Englishes called the International Association for World Englishes and journals devoted specifically to the study of world Englishes like world Englishes, English worldwide and English today. And we also looked at other scholars for instance Andy K, uh, Kirk Patrick and his uh, you know um, uh, his uh, <coughs> understanding of the causes of linguistic variation. We looked at Edward Edwin Thumbo and his concept of the relationship between literature and world English and this was an important point for us really. Uh, if you go back to the lecture you find that there are countries like India, Sri Lanka and Malaysia with long traditions of you know both oral and written traditions and, how, and one aspect of study is how the coming in of English and its variant of the variant of world English in India how it interacts with okay, or has interacted with the long tradition of oral and written um, uh, literature in India. Then we also saw uh, countries with yet more important or more sorry more powerful oral traditions like Ghana, Kenya etcetera and also it is worthwhile for us to study what happens when in English enters the scenario and, oh, and then English uh, vis a vis countries with col the colonial needs as it is put like South China, West Indies and Singapore. So, uh, to sum it up really the unity and commonality reworkings, the restorings and uh, resisting depersonalization through an alien language and modernity. These are some of the issues that some of you may take up if you are interested in research in this domain. Right? We also looked at a very beautiful piece an ex uh, extract from Kamala the Indian poet Kamala Das's and introduction. You may go, look, go back to our lecture there and see how this is being uh, discussed. For instance, she says, I speak three languages right in two, dream in one. Okay? It is half English, half funny, funny uh, half in, sorry, Indian, uh, funny perhaps, but it is honest. A beautiful poetic expression of such interaction. Okay? Now, we the topic as I said of discussion today is the rise of cultural studies. Okay. I am ending this module um, by bringing in this topic because you know the mo you know uh, we have already in fact made the move towards that right. When we say in our first lecture okay, in the introduction to this series of lectures that we do not we are not going to really talk about English language and English literature as has been traditionally understood though it has been named as such for various reasons the, the, the um, uh, course has been named English language and literature, but we said that um, our, our orientation or both our political and uh, or, or ideological and academic orientation would be towards studying the course or looking at the course from the point uh, really keeping in mind not really from the point of view really keeping in mind certain changes that have come up and uh, the new uh, new terminologies that have come up. For instance, we said that English studies is a far more encompassing term than English language and literature. Um, when we talk about English studies, we are you know not looking only at the literature produced in a country um, uh, or uh, produced in England, we are or by English uh, persons, we are looking at uh, literatures and languages okay, in all their varieties um, following the coming in of English in different nations. Okay. So, this also in a way connects us to the issue of cultural studies and this is what you know we are going to talk about now. Cultural studies is uh, an area which has been quite vociferous in its um, in its recognition of heterogeneity, okay, in its dismissal of grand frameworks of unitary frameworks, if you will, okay, and the recognition of um, you know uh, or recognition of varieties of culture, okay, the recognition of the importance of looking at issues like you know 
uh, components like gender, like race, like sexuality, like globalization for instance okay, in the theoretical production of our knowledge systems. Do you follow? Okay, so, that is why we are ending this um, uh, module with this lecture with uh, we saw that we are really in, uh, you know incorporating the cultural studies view in our in, in all our lectures in this. Okay, this these series of lectures <coughs> I would say fall uh, you know fall uh, between the traditionalist approach to English language and literature and the new approaches known as uh, you know English studies. Okay, M more of this or more many of these issues with regard to cultural theory etcetera are also taken up in the criticism module, the module on criticism which is the last module of uh, you know these um, series of lectures. Right? So, uh, if you ask me what then what kind of books may we look at when we talk about the rise of cultural studies uh, into literature and language. Then these are some of the books that you may look up if you want to study uh, cultural studies proper what is cultural studies and I would urge you to look at Chris Barker's Cultural Studies Theory and Practice, an immensely important book for beginners, um, one of the important textbooks okay, that could be prescribed and Chris Barker's The Sage Dictionary of Cultural Studies in order for you to understand concepts and you know uh, terms uh, quickly okay, at one glance. Uh, however, from the literary point of view, it is a very important book uh, by Anthony East Hope, excuse me, <coughs> entitled Literary into Cultural Studies. Okay, you see how it moves from literature to cultural studies. So, these are some of the books that you may want to use. Now, see East Hope's book Literary into Cultural Studies is one of our main uh, source textbooks in uh, you know in this course and I would like to begin uh, with um, you know two passages from Anthony's Hope's book. Right? So, let us read, read from East Hope and uh, try and unpack what he has said. So, this is East Hope. 20 years ago, the institutionalized study of literature throughout the English speaking world rested on an apparently secure and unchallenged foundation, the distinction between what is literature and what is not. Okay. So, what Aesop is saying here is you know English literature right up to 20 years from the present you know has enjoyed a certain stability uh, of definition, a stability of canon of syllabus for instance and what he calls it a secure and unchallenged foundation with one of the main dividing lines there being or determining lines there being the distinction as it says between what is literature and what is not. Okay. In a similar vein, we, we can also say that following Eastop that till uh, you know uh, quite some time ago the uh, you know uh, such studies were also secure with almost unchallenged right. Uh, definitions of what English literature and language, not simply literature, but English language and literature were. Okay, but today that sort of you know illusion is no longer there. There is no such certainty Eng by English literature or even by the English language. Okay, we may refer to a far more problematic issue than simply the language that has come to us from England. Okay, so cultural studies, therefore. Uh, we will talk about the you know uh, main tenets of cultural studies and understand this better in a while. Cultural studies um, problematizes essentialist definitions. For instance, if you ask a question like what is English literature, then the answer would be uh, you know it will not be an easy one that is you cannot say that it is a literature produced in England. Okay. So, there is a non essentialist one there will be several shades of English literature emanating from various different countries to follow. Okay. So, then following him again is to says in another extract here the old he says quite categorically please look at this slide the old paradigm has collapsed the moment of crisis symptomatically registered in concern with theory is now passing and a fresh paradigm has emerged. Okay. So, the 
old uh, in as an old crisis uh, sorry the old paradigm of certainties is no longer there and then we bring in cultural studies okay with all its varieties of you know techniques and tools of looking at literature and language and any cultural product for that matter any cultural artifact okay from a new paradigm right then further he says nothing is ever pure okay and rightly so cultural studies is as we say anti essentialist it is non ontological okay doesn't believe in essences also another word for it would be purity nothing is ever pure being at one with itself and paradigms are no exception okay so again it's not that paradigms are pristine and beyond the reach of human inquiry okay paradigms too are uh, in that sense impure or in that sense they are not transcendental okay they are amenable to change and to human inquiry and critique then he says between the literary studies paradigm as defined and the cultural studies paradigm advocated there are a range of empirical positions okay so as we move on from from a so called uh, you know literary literary criticism to a cultural criticism okay it's again not that cultural criticism is homogenous that it is not you know it, it is not that cultural studies has only one methodology that is both the beauty and the difficulty of doing cultural studies if you are a cultural studies scholar then you need to be well versed in several different positions theoretical positions ideological positions uh, that that have together come to be called cultural studies okay so let's read again between the literary studies paradigm as advo as defined and the cultural studies paradigm um, advocated there are a range as it says here a range of empirical positions a number of theoretical inputs have already an altered classic literary criticism and these are semiological marxist feminist psychoanalytic and the like okay so you have various positions from which to study not again here for our purposes in this uh, you know uh, in this course it's not simply you know i'm only taking off from anthony east hope it is not simply that you know these have um, critiqued or given us newer paradigms only in the field of literary criticism okay these are equally amenable to the study of languages right so a marxist view semiological view feminist psychoanalytic and the and the like okay post colonial for instance are also methodologies in cultural studies that look at to question this you know what do we mean when we say english language what do we mean when we say the english uh, or the english language or what do we mean by saying english literature okay so from various perspectives you then dismantle the older paradigm which would perhaps you know say that english literature or the english language is only that which has emanated from the mother country okay hence again let me remind you the term english studies okay vis a vis the older term of looking at you know english literature or uh, you know Uh, uh, english language that is why we brought in a uh, topic like international english or a topic like world englishes into this lecture to establish even if we go on later you know to talk about say the age of a uh, milton or the you know the augustan age etc it is um, important for us to remember that even as we study those okay they are today amenable to looking at them or at those issues from Uh, a perspective that is not simply built on english history or built on uh, you know english culture right the moment we talk about victorian english for instance then there are issues of colonialism etc that will come up the mod moment we talk about modernity for instance you know the um, the whole aspect of you know um, of uh, eastern philosophy for instance Uh, influencing poets like T. S. Eliot, for instance. Okay, these are things that are going to come in. However, let me again remind you, though the lectures following will not exactly be in, you know, because we are talking about the rise of cultural studies. Ending this module by uh, saying that you know there is already already a new paradigm called cultural studies. Do you follow? Okay, which you need to take into account as one that is already established, right? So we really, we really move between the traditional way of looking at English language and literature and the newer way of looking at English studies. Fine. Uh, now we will begin to talk a bit about 
cultural studies uh, without which you will not understand how the rise of cultural studies and the movement from literary uh, you know uh, essentialism right to cultural pluralism right how this change comes about we cannot know that without really knowing what cultural studies uh, as a discipline or a cluster of disciplines is so for that or keeping that in mind we look at an essay a very important essay by um, one of the most one of the foremost really okay uh, practitioners and theorists of cultural studies Stuart Hall okay without whose name there is really no cultural studies uh, or contemporary cultural studies uh, at least so Stuart Hall in his essay entitled cultural studies two paradigms okay uh, names these three scholars okay as uh, as uh, you know uh, sort of the you could say the progenitors okay or at least the legacy of culture contemporary cultural studies he says goes back to these three scholars okay and these are Raymond Williams as we shall see here and particularly his work now let us look at this slide please his work culture and society Richard Hoggard uses of literacy uh, and E. P. Thompson's making of the uh, English working class okay so these are the scholars who first you know sort of inaugurated like perhaps they uh, never knew that they would inaugurate a new discipline or a new domain of uh, inter interdisciplinary uh, studies known uh, as uh, cultural studies and that would and also that it would even come into you know uh, uh, the academic domain as a department of its own or a realm of study on its own right. Uh, Raymond Williams for instance in an important essay a base and superstructure in Marxist cultural theory and this is quoted in East Hope's book say, uh, uh, had this notion that uh, literary texts as he says are not objects, but notations. Therefore, literary study should break from the notion of isolating an object and on the contrary move to discover the nature of a practice and then its conditions. Okay, it was what we clearly call a materialist approach right. Literary um, texts, literary artifacts are to be inevitably okay, connected to or related to um, you know the conditions under which they have been produced. Right? Then text culture studies also holds that text may be a literary text or text from linguistics or text from uh, you know um, from language, literature, film, media etcetera that texts are basically interpretations. Okay? So, when you say that a text is an interpretation uh, you get rid of an essentialist um, you know understanding you know what you call a pure understanding of a text or an authoritative understanding of a text. Okay. So, cultural studies holds see there are so many theoretical positions like for instance we saw a while ago the Marxist approach, the semiological approach, the psychoanalytic approach etcetera or post colonial approach. Okay. So, these are different ways of interpreting a text and cultural studies celebrates this, this uh, you know um, this multi multimodal way of looking at text. Okay. It follows the post structuralist uh, you know orientation or it or you could say ideology by saying that no text may be pinned down to any one way of looking at it. The feminist ways of studying a text, there are post colonial ways of studying a text, structuralist ways of studying a text, Marxist ways etcetera. Okay. So, all texts are then interpretations. Why uh, uh, this helps us okay, when we study English language and literature as I said even if you study a you know um, uh, a text as even you know that goes back to uh, old English like Beowulf for instance. Okay, such texts are also today to be understood as not having one meaning, okay, but amenable so to speak amenable to several analysis several ways and degrees of analysis okay, from a cultural and a multicultural perspective or a multi uh, theoretical perspective. Right? Then uh, we remember we talked about Chris Barker's well, you know, um, um, you know books being uh, elementary and yet very important for us to understand uh, books like the sage dictionary for instance helps us to understand uh, you know uh, in almost glossary form okay, some of the important theoretical 
terminologies right in cultural studies. Now, let us read from the sage dictionary of cultural studies wherein Chris Barker says the domain of cultural studies can be understood as an interdisciplinary this is the point that we did raise a while ago did not we an interdisciplinary or then he says even a post disciplinary field okay? it moves um, beyond interdisciplinary to to sort of resolutely be a, being a way of study that is post disciplinary okay? that does not adhere to any um, um, any uh, discipline all right, but also it does not adhere to an interdisciplinary mode it has crossed the disciplinary boundaries so to speak. Okay? So, the domain of cultural studies can be understood as an interdisciplinary or even post disciplinary field of inquiry that explores the production and inculcation of culture or maps of meaning. Okay? So, it is basically any cultural theorist would tell you <coughs> sorry, that meaning the making and the interpretation and the understanding of meaning is one of the is really one of the core issues in cultural studies. Okay? How does meaning emanate? Okay? Then he says, however, cultural studies has no reference, you cannot refer to, you know, said, remember it is a plethora of you know for inter or post disciplinary approaches really which make up cultural studies and he says cultural studies has no reference you cannot say this, this is cultural studies. Okay? Cultural studies has no reference to which we can point rather it is constituted so beautifully put by the look at the slide peer, uh, here please rather it is constituted by the language game of cultural studies. Okay? This is tied to our previous point that of interpretation. Right? How you interpret entails certain ways of speaking right, or writing for that matter, okay. certain ways in which you are going to have a discourse building dif uh, discourses, okay, varied discourses for instance a Marxist discourse on a certain text okay, is going to in his words really play a different language game. Right? And we recall here the philosopher Wittgenstein and his idea of language games. Okay? So, you know putting or applying this to this dream, there is going to be every uh, theoretical methodology is going to have a different discourse with for instance base and superstructure. Okay? These are part of the discursive terminology of Marxism. Okay, they are not the ter discursive terminology of psychoanalysis for instance. Psychoanalysis would have different uh, ways of approaching the text. Okay, we talk about in the old Freudian discourse for instance, we may talk about the id ego, super ego or the Oedipus complex etcetera, which has been as you know applied to uh, the study of Hamlet and his relation with his mother. Right? So, however, again cultural studies has no referent to which we can point rather it is constituted by the language game of cultural studies that is let us look at this slide please that is the theoretical terms developed and deployed by persons calling their work cultural studies <coughs> sorry constitutes that which is cultural studies. So, cultural studies is not a you know does not refer to any a to any phenomenon phenomenon a it is it comprises certain ways of speaking which deploy develop and then deploy certain terminologies. So, by now you have an idea of what it entails to do cultural studies. right? So, you know the newer ways of again looking at language and literature okay, to sum it up uh, leads us away from essentialist you know geographically pinned. Okay, uh, demarcations of a particular literature or the literature of a nation etcetera, particularly England with its colonial history and the fact that uh, English is one of the most uh, you know um, is a language that has reached uh, several parts of the globe uh, mainly through its colonialist history. Okay? Then if you ask if you ask a question like what is culture? Okay, so, it is cultural studies and you know the rise of cultural studies. So, what is the seminal term here? What is the main term here culture and what does it mean? Okay? So, in cultural studies if you look at this slide here we may look 
at culture and or approach culture, the word culture. Remember, culture here is not, you know, what we understand by cultural program like dance, for instance, okay, or um, you know, like a play being enacted, for instance, or a performance, for instance. Though they may, they come in as cultural artifacts or cultural products, okay. Culture is importantly understood as something ordinary, not something extraordinary. Okay. So, culture is more ordinary than extraordinary, it is a way of life, a very loaded phrase really a way of life. What would a way of life mean? A way of life invo you know involves within its domain uh, actions, values, perceptions, okay, material practices, right? um, uh, ways of thinking, do you follow? ethical uh, uh, ideas of ethical conduct for instance, right? ideas of patriotism of nationhood anything, anything that is in our that forms a component of our way of life including the sciences. Okay? So, really when you talk about culture we are talking about life and all the components that go or go into life and, and which make us live lives in certain ways. Right? Cultural studies, culture here is understood as uh, democratized as shared. Okay. And as we had mentioned earlier, culture is to do with the creation, the development of meaning, the creation of meaning and the interpretation of meaning. Okay. So, we remember a cultural study just because you know it is so um, multi or interdisciplinary or post disciplinary, just because there are so many uh, you know theoretical and uh, theoretical orientations in cultural studies, ways of doing cultural studies, okay, so much so that it appears to some very chaotic, because it is not a way of looking at culture or cultural products like literary products for instance, it does not mean at all that anything goes okay, in cultural studies. So, we understand culture A as ordinary and not extraordinary, so that a literary text in cultural studies for many scholars okay, would be viewed in the same way okay, uh, the so called ordinary cultural products are looked at. So, a newspaper article, okay, a billboard, okay, a media product, popular culture these are at par with literature. Okay, remember what was the old paradigm literature uh, enjoyed uh, a very uh, you know a high status okay, uh, as part of high culture and other things uh, you know in departments of English you would not really be looking at popular culture, you would not be looking at uh, you know texts like um, a newspaper article for instance. Okay. The, the rise of cultural studies changes all this, the rise of cultural studies makes us consider a literary text as part okay, as part of culture as only one of uh, you know the forms of culture. Do you understand? Only one of the kinds of culture, right? So there is, there be, um, you know, there is an attempt at parity among uh, both high, okay, products of uh, cultural products of high, so-called high culture and so-called low culture. Do you follow? Okay. So remember, there is a particular way in which we look at cultural products, okay, in cultural studies. Then. There is an important, important difference between the so called you know language game kind or post structuralism based kind political uh, you know politically charged okay, um, domain called cultural studies and uh, another way of looking at culture is which, which we may call I, mean, I may hazard calling it really the anthropological way of studying culture. Okay. So, we must understand again that cultural studies is different from the study of culture. Okay. How it is different from the study of culture in that it specifically looks at symbolic forms in terms of their signifying practices. Okay. How symbolic forms right? and uh, even everyday life, material lives as symbolic forms, how they are really formed, the meaning is formed okay, through certain practices that signify something. Okay. For this you, uh, you know we will talk about signifying practices and the sign in our lecture on structuralist criticism. Okay. But suffice it for us here at this early stage to simply uh, understand the difference between cultural studies and the study of culture. Material forms are understood 
okay symbolically by what they symbolize and with this within this uh, you know inquiry form of inquiry come, will come in issues of identity of subjectivity of uh, you know of race of gender okay of ideology do you understand so these are all studied in those terms right whereas the study of culture in an anthropological sense does not necessarily have to do only this so you know the the paradox is on the one hand cultural studies is so you know full of heterogeneity and yet on the other hand it is quite pinpointed and it knows exactly what it is going to analyze okay now it doesn't mean that looking at a cultural form like literature from a signifying practices point of view doesn't mean again that it is uh, sort of it is it is, has nothing to do with marxism do you understand we the early on the onus was on a completely materialist way of looking at the at culture and relating the literary text to to uh, to culture to cultural practices and material practices okay we have that legacy and the legacy is intact but with the post structuralist turn what we also do is understand these forms uh, first okay as of course being part of a particular material culture but also insisting on what they signify okay the political aspects in these symbolic forms do you understand okay so then another important point as we as we talk about uh, you know english language and literature and other cultural forms is the term ideology one of again uh, you know one of the most important like meaning one of the most important terms in cultural studies and these you know ideology may be as i said um, it's a it's a world view is how you look at the world you know it's like a you know a set of lenses through which you look at the world okay you perceive the world judge the world judge others activities your own activities and formulate rules you know uh, rules to follow in your in uh, your as you go about your cultural living so ideologies if you look at this slide okay uh, refers to ideas certain ideas that you hold okay doctrines ideology is also known as consciousness your, your consciousness and awareness of the world they are maps of meaning and it is also as I said a world view okay uh, the view through which you look at the world and which subsequently uh, determines your actions and your thoughts so again we come back to east hope in this and see how it is connects okay to what east hope has to say and i'm reading again here east hope says as an expression of social power ideology can be understood in terms of a sociology of knowledge look at this again as an expression of social power ideology is something that has great social power how when some when people come together sharing a certain ideology okay it gives them a social you know a social power it helps them for instance to formulate rules to formulate uh, you know to uh, to uh, steer people's ideas towards their own world view for instance okay so ideology according to east hope is social power and has to be understood in terms of a sociology of knowledge do you follow okay knowledge is not pristine okay knowledge is constructed by ways of looking right that is why we no longer talk about knowledge with a capital k we talk about different knowledge systems knowledge with a small k okay different knowledge systems and in this ideological battle different ideologies right claim to shed different knowledge systems or or, or they they uh, uh, you know they create or construct different knowledge systems known as discourses do you follow okay so reading again from him as an expression of social power ideology can be understood in terms of a sociology of knowledge that is ideology always conforms to the interests this is very important to the interests of those from whom it comes so that what you think or say depends in part on who you are do you follow okay because ideology real recognizes the fact that it is we who create knowledge knowledge is not something that is given from the heavens okay knowledge is created by 
human beings like ourselves okay and hence as we say always provisional okay but when when people holding a certain ideology come together and particularly when they are in power particularly political power okay what happens is there is will always be a tendency by the ruling class to show that their ideology their ideas or ways of thinking or their you know uh, uh, say doctrines their maps of meaning are really the true maps of meaning do you follow okay so then again the classic marxist description let's look at this slide please the classic marxist description goes further than this by claiming not only that social being determines consciousness in the in this respect but specifically that ideology is determined according to economic class interest okay so uh, marxists go on not only recognize this as it says marxists go on to even say that it is the interests of a particular class as you know we will talk about this in our lecture on Marxist criticism class is the most important factor in Marxism the stratification is done in Marxism according to class okay? uh, not according to caste for instance or not according to gender as in feminism for instance. Okay? So, ideology in Marxism is in uh, you know it is um, inseparable from from the interests of economic classes. Okay? So, ideology is determined according to economic class interests and so by the position of the individual subject in relation to ownership, work and the mode of production. Okay? So, ideology um, is not enough for us to simply say that there are different ideologies. Okay? Following Marxism, we need to say that ideology is inseparable from economic class and class interests and the even so much so that even the individual subject is to understand him or herself okay, as being as the position that he or she occupies in the whole class structure okay, and in relation relationship to whether or not that person uh, uh, has ownership of the means of production okay, the kind of work or labor that a person does. And a person's uh, you know standing or status in the entire production process. Okay? Uh, this is most important in uh, the study of ideology. Then another aspect of cultural studies here is to what Hall's circuit of culture. Okay? Hall uh, described or delineated the circuit of culture in terms of five you know uh, five component components or component uh, uh, terminologies or terms these are a representation okay regulation consumption production and identity so when we look at english studies when you look at english language and literature then all these points come in okay for instance the representation of english in different world englishes do you follow okay the regulation of english Okay, how far the language is appropriated or you know manipulated or changed okay, the regulations for that okay, the consumption of English and the kinds of Englishes okay, the production of English language and literature and the identities you see the identities that are created by world Englishes or English all over the world. The identities that are created also by traditional canons of English and how everything is represented through uh, you know through these texts that we study. So, th the circuit of culture according to Stuart Hall really is a circuit uh, wherein the most important points are these, these are the nodal points really so to speak okay? representation right identity production consumption and regulation do you follow. If you know this then you will understand how as we say in the, we have said in this course the rise of cultural studies completely or if not completely in a very important way okay, changes our understanding of the so called English language and literature that we are talking about. So, this is a new uh, way in which Engli uh, you know uh, uh, because of which English language and literature today increasingly begins to be talked about in terms of English studies. Okay. Then these are also you know these are also discourses right. 
these are also discourses in the sense that so I had used uh, you know the word discourse uh, several times or you have, may have noticed in this uh, you know in this lecture okay so what really are discourses I said that cultural studies is also ways of speaking or discourses right uh, a discourse means so many things it means an both an object it means a, st a certain structured system okay uh, if you look at this slide uh, discourse also means ideological systems how is discourse an ideological system okay if you for instance um, explain a text or talk about a text, represent a text using a certain ideology, say Marxism or feminism or uh, even casteism for instance okay, or, or a capitalism ideology for instance. Okay. Then you are speaking, discourses are ways of speaking, you are speaking in a way, okay, speaking in a way which becomes an ideological system, it reinforces and re-establishes that particular ideological system. And in that sense, discourse is inseparable from ideology. Okay? Discourses are also definitely texts and texts are ways of speaking. It is not just a text is a way, it is simply a written product. There is a way of writing it and there are positions that people take and perspectives that people give when writing a text. Okay? Discourse therefore, once it is a part of ideology or once ideology is a part of discourse that is once you realize the fact that discourse and ideology are inseparable, what happens is discourse then creates power. Okay? If ideology is about power then discourse creates power and when it creates power then what happens is sometimes a discourse a dominant discourse becomes so powerful okay, that it is considered truth. Right? It is considered truth, it is considered the only meaning, there is no space for interpretations or heterogeneity of interpretations. Then um, uh, it, it determines the practices that we follow, that we do in our lives and also the morality or what is considered moral or immoral or legal or illegal. Okay? Such is the power of the dominant discourse in our, uh, you know. So, the the older paradigm of doing English language and literature, or literature in particular, was really uh, the dominant discourse. Now you understand, can relate this. Okay, was really the dominant discourse that was uh, trying to push literature into the realms of a so-called high culture and popular culture products into low culture. Do you follow? Okay, so discourse, ideology, these are power. These are some of the most uh, you know elementary topics and terminologies in uh, cultural studies as a discipline. So, also apart from these three terms are the terms identity and subjectivity. Okay? So, identity uh, in, in very elementary terms again the difference between identity and subjectivity is this uh, at least some scholars agree that subjectivity is our inner feeling. Okay? Our inner feelings, emotions etcetera what it feels like to be person X. Okay, or a collective subjective would, be, would, would mean what it feels to you know collectively to belong to a certain sect or a certain uh, you know race or a certain gender for instance. Okay, so, it is your inward looking, it is your inner, in, in, it's your inner um, uh, you know uh, how should I use it is, is the, the inner reality in you right and through which you perceive the world. Identity on the other hand is also uh, defined by many as the uh, as uh, you know how how society looks at you how society labels you okay hobo aise nikhe ek minute right so these are again some of the ways of looking at cultural studies in and also class ethnicity gender race sexuality these are other aspects of cultural studies right so um, let's do a quick recap really what we saw in our uh, you know in our uh, lecture today is you know we um, the need to bring in the need to bring in an area like cultural studies okay is imperative today okay cultural studies you know uh, the rise of cultural studies in studying uh, literature 
studying language and studying any text for instance okay, is related to the concepts to align uh, concepts like world English is for instance for interna uh, uh, a bit to international in English for instance okay, to world literatures okay, phenomena like world literature for instance okay, and the rising heterogeneity of criticism of criticism uh, that is critical practices of critical methodologies like post colonialism like gender studies for instance. Okay. So, it was important for us to end this module by looking at the rise of cultural studies and how you know things like English language and literature are today increasingly being couched in the terminologies of uh, you know this new label called English studies okay. and in that we found that culture is you know if we get the question like how is culture defined in cultural studies. Culture is defined as ordinary okay, study or you know it, it's these are ordinary practices that we do as we live out our lives okay. it is also to understood as meaning the creation uh, the development and the establishment and the interpretation of meaning. Okay. Uh, it also refers to you know ways of life, culture is a way of life or cultures are ways of life do you understand and culture is shared or it is democratized. Then if you ask then next who are the scholars or critics who you may identify or who have been identified by scholars like Stuart Hall as a you know sort of progenitors of the domain cultural studies right and these are scholars like particularly in the Marxist scholars like Raymond Williams, Richard Hoggart and E. P. Thompson with their emphasis on the on material realities of uh, te both texts and populations. Okay. Then uh, what is Stuart Hall's what do you understand by Stuart Hall's circuit of culture? We understand the circuit of culture in terms of its five most important components and these are you will recall um, uh, these are representation. Okay, these are this is uh, you know, it includes production, regulation, consumption, and identity, and all texts, literary or otherwise, may be understood. Okay, in relation to one or all or you know uh, some of these aspects. Do you follow? Then what are the other terms? What are the most important terms in cultural studies? Okay, which help. Remember, cultural studies we call cultural studies you know different ways. Of speaking, and that there is no, as Chris Barker tells us, there is no referent to that. This is cultural studies. Cultural studies is com, you know, uh, is comprised of, you know, different terminologies. So, what are some of the important terminologies? Okay, they. It's not necessary that these are terminologies that have been born in cultural studies, or that nobody else has understood or ever used them. Okay, but cultural studies has particular. Te, uh, you know technologies of understanding if you may use the word particular tools and these tools are discourse power identity subjectivity okay um, these are some of the words and also these categories like race class gender sexuality etc these terminologies have really in the end we should say this with Anthony is hope that these are terminologies that have completely ways of thinking and argument that have completely sort of destroyed or dismantled the older paradigms, essentialist paradigms okay, of that this is literature or this is culture etcetera okay, with, a, with a far more complex and definitely some would find complicated way of uh, studying culture and in this case studying also studying English language and literature. Thank you.